Um, I, I love that song, Victory in Jesus. It's actually like one of the first songs that I memorized when I first became a Christian. Um, so it brings back a lot of, a lot of memories, actually. So I uh, appreciate that. So anyway, uh, in your bulletins, uh, there are some things that are going on. If you wanted to turn there and look up. Uh, first thing I wanted you guys to, to know is that seven, seven men just got back from um, the uh, uh, Northwest Men's Retreat, and uh, we had a fantastic time. Uh, there's a lot of, lot, of, lot of time to rest and reflect and, and to hear from the messages from the speakers and different things like that, and to, to do a lot of, lot of things. And, you know, we don't ever come back hungry, I know that, so... Um, but I just want to encourage the women. It, it's set up very similar. Um, it is May 2nd through the 4th. There is a sign-up list down there. The time is running short. You can go if you're, you're um, 7th grade to, to 150, okay? Um, it does not matter what age you are. It is a time of, of good spiritual reflection, a good time of, of fellowship. And uh, I just want to encourage the ladies to go and to be thinking about those things and see if they were, were interested in doing that. So um, uh, on that note as well, the, our, our Women's Connect is going to meet uh, April 27th here at the church. I um, look forward to that as well. Uh, our youth group is do, starting to do a service project tonight. Um, so that's going to go on. So we need as many youth, youth as we can to help us with that. Um, Church camp is just right around the corner. You see the dates in there, but we also, our, our uh, camp does it through like uh, uh, donations and different things like that. So one of the things that we've been asked to do as a church is provide some, some things for the camp, some food for the camp. Um, that list is in, in the bulletin here as well, but there is now a sign-up list down on the bulletin, or not a sign-up list, but a, a tally uh, list on the board that, that will tell us how much uh, we've got so far. So if you're thinking, well, I want to do the 10 boxes of cereal, I better go down and check the list. And so if nothing is crossed off, then, then we don't have that yet. But if it's crossed off, then we don't have it. Because we don't need 20 boxes of, uh, of Rice Krispie cereals or 20 boxes, whatever. But try to pay attention to that. That would be awesome if you wanted to do that as well. Um, just some minor, minor stuff happening around here. Uh, Tuesday, if you were thinking about coming by the church on Tuesday, the church is closed on Tuesday. Okay? We are uh, going to have the carpets all cleaned that day, and it's an all-day project. So if you can try to avoid the church that day, I sure would appreciate that because I'm not even going to be here because I don't, I don't want to be here for that. So, um, But we are uh, looking forward to that, getting some of this carpet here all cleaned and everything like that. All, all, basically, all this carpet looks like this is going to get cleaned. So um, it hasn't been done since I've been here. And so just to give everybody a heads up, if you're thinking about coming by the church on Tuesday, don't. Okay, it's closed, right? So, um, and then the last thing I have for you is the mayor's uh, prayer banquet. It is next week, okay? And so um, I believe all the tables are sponsored now, so you can disregard that $15 a person. Uh, so it, from what we've been hearing is that um, if they didn't get all the tables sponsored, like local businesses and stuff, then you would have to have $15 deep, but there is no cost now. It is, it is free, correct? That's our understanding. Um, there's, there's, um, so that's coming up, but that is next week. And so our church, so if anybody from our church wants to go, we have eight spots available, okay, next, next week, next Sunday at 1 o'clock. Uh, our church sponsored a table for our our congregation, but we also sponsored a table for anybody in the community that that does doesn't you know wants to come. Leaders, uh, veterans groups, um, whoever wants to come. So our church has sponsored two tables, but one is specifically for anybody that wants to go. Um, and that doesn't say only eight people can go, okay? Because what it is is we're praying for our leaders of our our community. We're trying to trying to raise up our leaders to, to be more godly, to, to pray for them and allow God to go in front of them and allow God to, to work in this community and through our leaders and things like that, okay? And so it's going to be next week down at uh, the Community Bible Center gymnasium thing that's down the street here, and it starts at 1 o'clock, and uh, there's, you know, you can see all the other stuff. There's special speakers and, and different things like that, but there's going to be several of us praying 
Uh, there, there's, there's three of us, I believe, from here that are going to be praying. So, um, but that's coming up. And uh, if you are interested in that, please attend. I think it's going to be a great thing. Uh, prayer always uh, accomplishes great things. You know, we know what Scripture tells us. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And I believe if we're praying, uh, and we're praying for our leaders uh, in our community, the ones that God has appointed, um, it's not going to hurt, okay? It's actually going to help. So if you if you were encouraged to attend that, I, I would ask that you would do that. Yes, Tolan. Um, also, I, I, Kit said that like all the table stuff are, are set, paid for and whatnot. Um, but if you still want to help, they only have about 45 minutes to get everything set up after church. And so if you want to go down and help set up tables and chairs and stuff, they are looking for lots of help to try to get that all put together before it starts. So, okay. um, so they really could use some help. Um, we'll talk to our youth group tonight about it too. But um, it'd be as soon as we get, as soon as Kit gets done talking and we can get out of here, we can go down and, uh, and help set up if you guys would be interested in helping. So. Okay. And there are vet drink tables been sponsored, so if you're a vet, you're welcome to sit at those tables. Are there any questions about that next week that we don't understand? Okay. Is there anything that I, I missed about it? Okay. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm attending. Yes, Roxy. Do we still need to call and sign up, though, right? So they have numbers? I'm getting a head count. Of people that I know for sure want to come. So if you know you would like to come, you can let me know and I can pass that along. Okay, there you go. But they're not going to turn away anyone. Like if you decide you're going to be busy and then all of a sudden next week you're not, just come. Even if it's standing, you can listen to the speaker and yeah, we want people to fill the place. Thank you. So. No. Okay, anything else? Any other questions about that? All right, let's pray and then I'll hand it back over. Lord, we just come to you to say thank you so much for this day. And thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here together as family, to worship, to, to lift up your name, to sing songs of praise, to gather at your table, to hear from your word, to, to communicate together, Lord, and to, to fellowship with one another. Lord, we are so thankful, Father, that what you did for us at the cross, Father, the price you paid, the, the death you defeated, the victory that was won. We are so thankful for those things, Lord, and, and that's why we come together as believers, to worship you. And Father, I pray that you work on our minds and our hearts this day, that you, you might mold us and shape us and, and grow us, and Lord, um, plant seeds, whatever it is, Lord, I pray that you would just help us to, to have, be open to, to what you are saying to us today. And Father, we're just always so thankful for our brothers and sisters and the encouragement that we receive and the love and the, the acceptance. And I pray that you'd help us to continue to live that and to be open to anybody and everybody, Lord. And, uh, I pray that you would just help us to, to move everything to the side and to allow our focus and our gaze to be upon you, Lord. It's in Jesus' precious and holy name that I pray. Amen. If we rise again, we're going to sing our God. <coughs> Oh, 
I'm almost 100% positive that song is based on John 3.30. So um, if you don't know what John 3.30 says, I'm going to tell you right now. Um, John the Baptist recognized his ministry had grown. It was so big. And people were coming to him everywhere. And when he saw Jesus, he realized in that moment that he's the Messiah. And in John 3.30, he says, he must become greater and I must become less. And, you know, as, you sing, as we sing these songs, we're not just singing them to sing them. We're singing them to, to fill our spirits and our minds with what the Lord is saying to us. And it, it gets us to that place uh, of worship where we bow at the throne of Jesus. And if... If Jesus is not the, on, on the throne of your heart, I encourage you to, to look more into to that. And if he is, if you live your life in a way that you outshine Jesus, we need to remember that he must become greater and I must become less. I've lived my life a long time, for the, almost the last 15 years, trying to reduce who I am and to elevate Jesus to the place that that they see Jesus. And so I love that song. Thank you for sharing it. And uh, just encourage all of you to, to look, to let Jesus be the one that shines and not, not you. So anyway, um, at this time on the Baxter Boltons is our prayer and our praise time. And um, I just want to know how we could be praying for you and uh, how we'd be lifting that up or adding things to the bulletin. And uh, I want, I want to start off by, um, talking to some, all of us here. Our friend Mike Dean, um, he's been the, the interim minister at New Hope Christian Church, our brother church in Great Falls, um, for, how would you guys long to say, 10, 12 years, something like that? Anyway, he's been battling cancer for a very long time, and uh, he called me this week and he told me that there's not much left that they can do, and so... Um, his name is Mike Dean. He's got a wife and a kid that still lives with him. And so if you could be praying for Mike in that situation that's going on there, I know he'd greatly appreciate it. And um, just be in, in heavy prayer for, for Mike because it's, it's been a long road. And, and if you know Mike, he's always optimistic and positive about life and everything. He's like, oh, God will do what God's going to do, you know. And, and uh, it's just... It's been an amazing testimony in his life how positive he is, but I know that he got some bad news this week, and so um, be praying for Mike and his family. I sure would appreciate that. Anything else that we pray for you about? Donna. Pray for my son David. He's been out of the service for almost two years. Donna's asking us to pray for her son, David, who, who, who battles uh, dreams and nightmares from his time in the, in the service. So be praying for her son, David. Lois. Um, my grandson, Dakota Pote, um, got word that his daughter's mother, they aren't married, he's got half custody of the baby, but she was ordered into drug rehab this week. And if she didn't go, she was going to lose the baby, which is also Dakota's daughter. And so Dakota left his job to drive home Friday to be with his daughter and just be with the family and hope everything is going okay. okay. Anything else? No. Nope. Okay. Uh, Lois's uh, grandson, Dakota Poti, has a daughter with a, a gal who He's going into rehab, and he's left his, not, I assume he didn't quit his job. No, he just left. Okay. He, he, he went home to take care of his daughter, so, which that's a good thing. Uh, but be praying for that whole situation with the daughter and the mother and, and Dakota, so we sure would appreciate that. Judy. Walter Reed has been moved permanently, I think, to the Ruby home in Great Falls. And Karen will stay here. Walt, Walt Reed has been moved to the Ruby home in uh, Great Falls permanently, so be praying for him in that situation and, 
and Judy said Karen is staying here, his wife. So, um, so be praying for that whole situation. I'm sure, would appreciate that. And, uh, um, but yeah, that's that's a tough tough situation. So, anything else? Yes, no. Um, I'd like to pray for a friend and coworker of mine, Joshua Rollins. Uh, he recently had a death in the family, and I'd like to pray for him, his family, and his brother. Okay. Um, and his brother? Oh, my mistake. Uh, he's the one who's passed. Oh, okay. All right. My mistake. So Noah's got a friend that he works with named Josh Rollins. Um, he had a death in the family. His brother <coughs> passed away. So be praying for that family. That's that's awful. So, um, so his name is Josh Rollins. Any else? Will you pray with me? Lord, we just come to you to say thank you, Lord, for being able to talk to you and to be able to come to you with, with things that are on our hearts. Lord, I know that you call us to preach the word wherever we go, but Lord, sometimes this life just beats us up and gets us down. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to bring those things to you. And Lord, as we do right now, we have friends and, and uh, family that are hurting and uh, we know our friend Mike, he's, he's in, a, in a bad situation, Lord, with his cancer. We know that you sustain all things in your hands, and so we ask, Lord, that you would do what you're going to do. And we trust in your goodness, and we trust in your will in his life. Father, we pray for his wife, and we pray for his son. Lord, we know that, that it's such a tough situation uh, that they're dealing with, and so we lift him up to you and ask, Father, that you would be gracious and that you might take care of him and take care of whatever needs to be done, Lord. Father, we want to lift David up to you as he, as he battles nightmares and dreams, Lord. And we, we want to ask that you would be with him and calm his mind as he sleeps. Father, just pray for those, those dreams and nightmares to subside and to cease a little bit, to, to take away the, the awful parts, and Lord, and that he might dream about the good, good times and the good memories, Lord. We just ask that you protect his mind. Father, we want to lift Dakota up to you. Father, being the, being the dad of, of this young, young daughter, Lord, I, I pray that you'd help him to do what's right by her, to protect her and to, to guard her and to um, raise her. Father, just I know it's a difficult situation with him working on the river and things like that, Lord, and well, we ask that you would do what, what is necessary in that situation, that you would impress it upon Dakota's heart to do what is necessary as well. Father, we want to pray for our friend Walt and Karen, our friends Walt and Karen, that, that as they are now separated, Lord, that, that you would be with them. Be with Walt as he's at the Ruby home, and as Karen, she's staying here. Father, we ask that you would just give them peace, and uh, Lord, as... As the end of life approaches for them, I pray, Father, that you would just um, be gentle and kind with them, Lord. And, and we trust in your goodness again in, in their lives. Father, we just ask that you would be with Josh Rollins and his family today, Lord. What a terrible tragedy it is to lose a loved one, especially a brother. Father, death is an awful thing in this life, but... Those of us who, who put our hope and our trust in you, Lord, we know that death is not the final place. So, Father, I pray that you might give this, allow this to be an opportunity in Josh's life if he doesn't know you, Father, that, that you might speak to his heart, that you might allow Noah to be used to speak life into his, his, his time, or that he might share, that Noah might share you with him. Father, we're just so grateful and thankful for what you did at the grave, what you did at the cross, and Father, how you defeated death. And we pray, Father, that as we put our hope in the resurrection, as we look forward to what you have for us, we pray that we would live in live this life preaching the word wherever we go and telling as many people as we can about you. Lord, thank you so much for, for loving us. Thank you so much for, for paying for our sin at the cross. Lord, and as a congregation, Lord, as family, we come together. And we just say thank you. And it's in your precious and holy name that we do pray. Amen.
Scholars disagree over whether Judas was still present 
in the upper room when Jesus called for a new bread and cup occasion, a new Passover meeting. But we know Judas was there long enough to be given one last gracious opportunity to repent in John 13, verses 18 through 30. When Jesus said, the one to whom I will give, it was Judas's fingers and thumb grasping the saw, a grasping motion that characterized his lifestyle controlled by greed, not grace. Each who comes to this table with Jesus has a Judas choice to repent and say, Lord, I am deeply sorry for my sin, or to say, excuse me while I go out to sin some more. Judas cared so little for Jesus' well-being, he saw only money signs. What is he worth? Well, that is a question that is answered here at this table. What is he worth? <coughs> is he worthy of devotion? Worthy of obedience? Worthy of repentance? Will we sit quietly, repentantly, or are we in a hurry to get out and get on with our life? Do we make the Judas choice? He repented. But too late. Jesus died because of Judas's sin, and he died for Judas's sin. Then sadly, Judas died unnecessarily for his own sin at his own hand. Those are the choices, die for one's own sin or allow Christ's death to be a personal atonement for one's sin. Judas sits here at this table, and Satan stands ready to jump in as lord of, his, of the unre unrepentant life. Which Lord will you choose here as your own? When Jesus said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me, in Mark chapter 14, verse 18, the only question I can ask, the only one you can ask, is, 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 it, is it I? For Judas, the answer rang clearly, yes it is. What is Jesus' answer to me? He is my Lord. Or he is not. Here I give my confession. Here I give my answer. Shall we go to the Lord in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to commune with you at this time, to partake of a, the bread which represents your body and the loaf which represents the blood that you shed. And as we partake, where is our mindset? Do we focus on you? Do we focus on what you've done for us? Do we focus on that cross where you hung? Do we focus on that grave where they buried you? Do we focus on the fact that you were no longer there? You rose from the grave and showed your dominion even over death, that you had power over death. Do we focus on the promises that you have made to us in that if we accept you as Lord and Savior, that we too might have a place in heaven. Do we look at ourselves? Do we look at the sins that we have committed? For we know that we all are, are sinful. Do we ask for repentance, true repentance? Do we ask for help to, to live a better life, for God's help in walking a straighter life through life, a straighter path through life? Lord, there are so many things that we can focus on as we partake of these emblems. And I just pray that we don't look past it, that we don't look to what's coming up in the week to come, that we look and see Jesus, see his sacrifice, see the love that he poured out for us on that cross. Focus on the promises that he made to us, for we know that everything that he said was true. Lord, I just pray that you would be your be, be with each one of us as we partake this day. Be with us in the week to come, Lord. Help us to see you in all things that we say and do. Help us to show love to one another in everything that we do. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for these emblems. In Jesus' name I pray this this morning.
So, we're in our uh, one series on, based on Ephesians 4, um, verses 3 through 6, and uh, where Paul is reminding us again about the unity of the Disney church. And so, I want to share a story with you first. Um, one that I read this week is, it's about a loaded minivan. Um, and this loaded minivan pulls up to uh, the only remaining campsite, okay? Four young kids leap out of the vehicle, and they feverishly begin unloading the gear, they begin setting up the tent, they begin doing everything they need to do. The boys rush off to gather firewood, while the girls along with their mother begin to set up the camp stove and the cooking utensils and all those things. A nearby family was watching them and, and marveled at the children's father and asked him, that has got to be the greatest display of unity and teamwork I have ever seen. How do you run such a well-organized family? The father said, well, it really works on only one basic principle. Nobody gets to go to the bathroom until the camp is set up. <laughs> now, when a family shares one goal, one common goal, they can really, really harmonize and work towards that common goal, can't they? <coughs> now, now, we, now I share that funny story with you because the same is true of the Christian family, of, of this family right here. And if you, this is your first time here for this series, I want you to understand that we're in week three of this series, of this, this idea of Christian unity. And, and on the eve of Christ's crucifixion, in John ch chapter 17, he prayed. One of, the, one of the most lengthy prayers that Jesus shared was for us, the future believers, to have the unity together as his followers. That everyone would believe in him, that everyone would be one, and that we would have this unity that we experience in God to be through Jesus and the Holy Spirit. It's an amazing prayer. And, and, and Paul began to preach this throughout his churches that he established, like in Corinth, and Philippi, and Colossae. And, and, and Ephesus, he records it in a letter that he writes to the church of Ephesus in chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. And if you have your Bibles, please follow along. Paul says, make every effort, every effort, not some effort, every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Seven ones. Create this foundation for all believers everywhere to, to, to have this unity of the spirit. Okay? And a, and a quick recap if you haven't been with us for the whole time. So a couple weeks ago, we started with the first item, the one body. Despite the differences that we might have across congregations and denominations and individual <coughs> Christians, the belief that there is one body of Christ and every born-again believer is a part of that body. Okay. Last week, we focused on the second uh, tie that binds. It's the one spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that indwells in each and every believer and presents us with special spiritual gifts to each one of us. The Spirit alone decides who gets what gifts, and He intends for us to use those gifts for the common good of the church, to serve each other, to serve and help each other. This morning, we're going to look at the next one, One Hope. I love the way the New Living Translation puts it in, in, in their translation. It says, one glorious hope for the future. I love that. And it makes me think about what is to come. So let me pray, and then we'll dig in. God, I just come to you to, to thank you so much for your word. And as always, Lord, I pray that you move me out of the way, that you might speak to our hearts and our minds to what you tell us this day. We love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, before we get to discussing this one hope, I want you to understand that, that hope is something we all share. And I want you to understand that, that what, what we mean by hope, okay? Because we use the word hope a lot, do we not? We talk about things like, I hope my team wins the Super Bowl, right? I hope I get a raise. I hope, I hope I get that 
birthday present or and so on and so on, right? There's no guarantee about getting those things, is there? You might think, well, I hope I have a good day, but of course there's no guarantee that you have a good day, correct? <coughs> yes, no? Yeah. Right? But that's not how the Bible uses the word hope, okay? It isn't wishing for the best. It isn't waiting to see what happens and crossing your fingers and hoping it turns out well, right? For Christians, hope is not a fleeting feeling or a fickle emotion, okay? Here's what I believe hope is. Hope is a confident expectation, and it's an anchor for our soul, right? Elsewhere in Romans chapter 8, verses 24 and 25, we see what God tells us about hope. He says in verse 24, he says, For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is not seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? And then verse 25 says, But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. You kind of get the idea of what this biblical hope is, I hope, right? That we confidently and patiently and waiting for, looking forward to something that we yet do not have, correct? But what is that? Right, the, the New Living Church is that one glorious hope for the future that is, is what unites us all as Christians. Now, if I was to ask you, what, do we, what would we hope for as Christians, what would that be? It's a simple answer, I promise. Heaven, that's right. Eternal life, heaven. That's right. It's the end journey for believers. It's the beginning of eternal life. It's the subject of, of hundreds of hymns and, and songs and, and sermons. I'm telling you, it's the moment you don't want to miss. It's the moment that, that people won't miss. You see, heaven is the home of glory and of goodness. It's, a, it's, it's of grace and of God himself. Heaven is our highest hope. But what makes heaven so glorious? Why we look forward to it with patience and confidence? How does the hope of heaven bring us all together? Right? And we look at this idea of, of this hope that we long for, this umbrella that, that seeing Jesus face to face. Right? There are at least three promises that I came up with and uh, uh, that we anticipate, this idea of this hope of, of what heaven creates for us. And these three promises that, that make heaven altogether, well, heavenly. Okay? And so, as we look at these three hopes today, uh, I pray that you would, would, would see them and, and, and know them and, and look forward to them, okay? The first one, obvious, is the hope of resurrection. All right? Number one, the hope of resurrection. Now, I can tell you, the beginning of my 1968, there's been this movement of, of this fascination with the dead coming back to life, right? <laughs> there was a pop culture classic known as Night of the Living Dead that, that came up. And, and we have this, this television show that ran for like almost 12 years called The Walking Dead. It was a huge popular TV show. And the truth is, however, though, that there is a day coming when the dead will rise, but they will not be zombies, okay? Okay. <laughs> Jesus speaks of this day in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. He says, Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. This day of resurrection is one of the most important themes of the entire Bible. Jesus resurrected to show us that he controls death and that the death is not the final place. You see, and it's also a reminder that this life is not all there is. You see, when we think about the pop culture things, you know, that we see the decaying things and different whatnot, but, but that's not what the Bible talks about. The Bible talks about that we look forward to this vibrant new body, far better than the ones we have now. The Bible says that in that same passage 
in Romans 8, 23, says, Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grow inwardly as we wait. There's that hope. Eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Again, the New Living Translation puts it this way. We, too, wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. You see, this idea of this new body is something that we hope for, the hope of the resurrection, right? God, through the Apostle Paul, writes in, in depth about these new bodies in his letter in Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, we, we hear about this. For we know that if, we, if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands, Meanwhile, we grow and long to be clothed instead of our heavenly dwelling, with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we'll not be found naked. For we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be enclosed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Verse 5 says, Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Our body being a tent is not a bad metaphor, is it? Because when I think about tent camping, right? I spent a lot of nights in tent camping, okay? It's nice for one, two, three nights. I'm not talking your, your, your wall tent, okay? Because I know you can make wall tents really nice. I'm talking your, your cheap $40 Walmart tent that you take out with your kids, okay? Those are not intended for long-term use, even though they could be, right? Flies open, cold creeps from beneath, summer showers can soak you from above. I remember this one time, me and my buddy went camping. We were camping in my, my, my mom's uh, uh, woods that was next door. She had about three acres of woods next to her house. And we go out there, we find this really flat spot's been cleared out. And we're like, man, this looks great. Okay? As 16-year-olds, as what we fail to see is that there's, a, there's kind of a steep bank here. Not, not real steep, but a steep bank here. And it kind of levels off here. What do you think that was? It was like a watershed. Yeah. So we go to sleep that night. And uh, our, our tent is actually facing up that way where the water was going to come from. And, and uh, it downpours that night. And uh, me and my body are sleeping in about that much water. Not, good, not a good time. We got up and... We, we, we threw all our crap to the side, and we went back to my mom's house, and we slept on the floor. It was better than freezing to death in the cold, right? We need something better, right? Paul argues something permanent, something that's painless, something more than flesh and bone. It's a house, not a tent. And until we get it, Paul says we groan. Right? Lately, I've been groaning a lot. My back of mine has is, is, is got, me, got me complaining a lot, right? Sometimes my knee flares up. I remember, what was it, last summer, two summers ago, we were on vacation. I wake up, my knee's about the size of a basketball. And I'm like, what's going on? Right now, if I sit for too long in one position, I, my back gets a little sore. I get tired, I get worn out, my joints ache, my muscles fatigue. Can you relate? Right? <clears throat> my tent used to be strong and sturdy, a, a little bit stronger and sturdier, though. Right? But the seasons have passed, storms have raged, life has happened, and, and, and this old canvas here is worn thin. And I know some of you have, have older canvas than I do. So I... You know, one thing I always, one thing I always uh, gave my, my grandpa a hard time about was how he could always feel the cold on his feet, okay? I was always just like, how, how do you feel that cold? How, how, how do you feel a draft? Guess who feels a draft on their feet now? <laughs> right, okay? You kind of get it. And this plate, this, this, this tent starts to wear out and gets thin and and, you know, who, who would ever thought that being in Montana that, that the wind would push me over, right? 
I'm six, three and a half, 280 pounds, and now I'm out there in the wind, and I'm like losing my balance. I'm like, man, never happened before. I don't know what's going on with me. I'm not as strong as I used to be. I know that. I do know, however, that it will not be like that after the resurrection, though. The Bible uses a lot of words to describe our new bodies, glorious and powerful, imperishable, immortal, eternal, supernatural, heavenly. That, that sounds good, doesn't it? Especially with present, present feelings that I have right now. Because God says us that, tells us that these bodies will be built to last. Is why he describes our new bodies this way. Can I tell you that this is the hope of all believers? The hope of the resurrection. Life without aging. Life without cancers. Life without heart attacks. Life without hip or knee replacements. Life without limits. All throughout Jesus' ministry, he promised one thing that no one could ever offer. Eternal life with him. Immortality in heaven. Jesus declares, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full in John 10.10. 10. And Jesus is speaking of quantity and quality, both beyond any measure. You see, the hope of the resurrection is just part of what we hope for, folks. You see, next, we hope for righteousness. And you might go, Kit, righteousness, what do you mean? Listen to me. God, through, through Peter, touches on this in 2 Peter 3.13. He says, but in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward, that's the hope again, to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Kim, what's righteousness have to do with any of this, right? As Christians, we look forward to a home where righteousness fills the air like the soothing aroma of, of fresh cinnamon rolls being baked. You might be asking yourself, what is righteousness exactly? That's a big church word that we sometimes get confused. Simply put, it's right. What is right? God is going to make it right. In heaven, God will make everything right. And, and one of the reasons many of us long for our heavenly home is we look forward to look, we look at a, we look at the world around us, right? We see how things are falling apart everywhere. Things just aren't right. We see, we see immorality. We see unjust. We see natural disasters. We see terrorist attacks. We see things like rape and murder and theft and cancers and, and, and the list goes on. And when Jesus promises us a new heaven and a new earth, a better earth, it's going to be the home of righteousness. In Revelation 25, or 21, 5, he says, I am making everything new. He will, make, he will remake everything in the world and he will put it all right. You know, I'll tell you what. It's one of the things I really struggle with in this world. I look out, not just in Fort Benton, but I look at the world that surrounds us and, and, and my heart breaks. And I know that I can't do anything for something unjust happening in the Congo, but it still breaks my heart. And I can go to the one that can, can cure that, right? I can ask the one that has the answers. I can talk to the one that, that might be able to solve those problems if it's in his will. You see, when we look at this world, and we see how broken it is and how broken we feel, you see, God's going to restore all of that. He's going to make everything new. He, and he's going to restore those smiles that have been faded by hurt. He's going, to, he's going to replay the symphonies for those the unheard by deaf ears. He's going to allow people that were blind to see sunsets. The mute will sing. The poor will feast. The wounded will heal. And of course, I don't know 100% certainly what that's going to look like, but I know that the blind will not be there. The deaf will not be there. They, no, they'll be there, but they won't be deaf and blind. <laughs> Sorry, I just spoke there. But of course, one of the greatest blessings of heaven is what won't be there, right? Sin and suffering. They cannot dwell in the home of righteousness. 
Revelation 21, 4 says, He will wipe away every tear from, from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He will make everything right. And can I tell you that that's just the beginning of the list. In the home of righteousness, there will be no drunkenness, disease, or divorce. No trials, no tribulation, turmoil, no funeral homes. No abortion clinics, no psychiatric wards, no rape, missing children, drug rehabilitation centers. I could go on and on and on and on. But what will be there? It will, it will overflow with unrelenting fairness and friendship, justice and joy, goodness and grace, virtue and valor, love and loyalty, happiness and holiness. It will be the home of righteousness, and we put our hope in that knowing that this new heaven and this new earth will provide the home of righteousness, and God will make everything right. The last thing we hope for is the hope of reunion. God, through, through Paul, writes at length about the hope of reuniting with believers. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, he says, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive who are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive or left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. It's the hope of reunion, folks. When, when the time comes for those of us that are found in Christ, it will herald the biggest family reunion in history. Can I tell you that? Christ will bring in with him all loved ones we've laid to rest in his arms, everyone who trusted in him for their salvation. It'll be husbands and wives and parents and children and great-grandparents and long-lost relatives that we knew nothing about. Those miscarried babies, they'll be there. Some people you might see, be surprised to see. Others you might be surprised to see too, right? <laughs> you can throw your arms around them and tell them how much you miss them. You'll be able to walk and talk with them and tell about your life since you last saw them. I always ask the question, who do I look forward to seeing that day? Can I tell you outside of my family and my friends who I'll meet that day? The most important meeting will happen that day as well. The hope of a reunion that I'll see Jesus face to face. It will be the most meaningful encounter that I will ever have. Because it was the most meaningful encounter that I have here on this earth. When I was told about Jesus for the first time. When I heard about how much he loves me. And how much he cared for me. And how much he, he did for me. And as my heart began to... to process that and, and to turn to that man I look forward to that, that big big bear hug he'll give me I won't feel so big all the time there's a Christian recording artist named Bart Miller from the band Mercy Me some of you might have heard of the band he captured the, the idea of, of it in a song called I Can Only Imagine I want to share part of it with you he says, I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. He says, surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? I will sing hallelujah. Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. When born-again Christians get to heaven, we won't have to imagine anymore, will we? What we have only seen in our thoughts and maybe our dreams, we'll see with our own eyes. What we struggle to envision, we are free to stand before and behold. What we've only seen a glimpse of through Scripture, we will see in full view. And the Bible tells us that we will be amazed. Not just like, wow. It'll be awe amazement. 
you know, the chin to the floor. I can't believe what I'm seeing. So this hope that we, this one hope that we are, unites us as Christians is th these things. This, this hope of, of, of heaven, the hope of a new body, and the hope of the, or the, hope of the resurrection. The hope of the resurrection, the hope of reunion. <coughs> you see, we're going to spend eternity together, are we not? And that's one of the common things that we need to understand. If we're going to spend eternity together, shouldn't we get along here? And that's what Paul is trying to get us, that's what God through the Apostle Paul is trying to get us to see, is that unity that, that brings us together is that one hope and that common dream, that common destiny, that common place. You see, it's that knowledge that God will bring us where he's at. And it ought to motivate us to have a head start. See, the church is the body of Christ, and it ought to be a preview of what heaven looks like now. In Revelation 7, 9, it tells this. this is, uh, uh, John writes, after this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude no one could count. From every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Every nation, tribe, people, and language. See, that's the common unity that we have in the hope of heaven. The hope of the resurrection and the hope of the reunion is that we hope for that. And we anxiously await that. We wait for that. We, we can't wait to get there, right? And that's what the hope that we share together is. And I pray that as we, we move towards that together as a congregation and as a family, that we would allow others to be a part of that, to unite us in that one hope. You see, may we make this world look a little more heavenly with the hope that we have. Will you pray with me? God, I just come to you to say thank you for this day and thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to preach your word. Father, I pray that that one hope that would unite all of us through the Spirit with the bond of peace, Lord, that, that would bring us together, that we look forward to what you have for us. We look forward to that day when we can ditch these bodies, Lord. The day that we get to see you face to face. Father, I just pray that you'd help us to to make this world more like what your kingdom in heaven is like now. Unite us in the one hope. May we work towards that common goal of uniting all believers in that one hope. Father, we are so thankful for what you do for us. It's in Jesus' precious and holy name that I pray. Amen. Our music team's going to come up and there's going to be an invitation time if you want to talk to me about that one hope. If you've never heard that Jesus loves you so much, he'll go to the cross for you. I want to talk to you. If you don't know what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ, I want to talk to you. You're going to have time to come up as we sing, and I encourage you to do so if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So let's stand and let's sing.
pray with me. Lord, we just come to you to say thank you again for this day to be here. We thank you for the opportunity to worship together as family. And Father, may we be united in that one hope as we go out from here. That we might preach the word wherever we go. Thank you, Father, for all that you do. May we hope for what we long for. And we wait for it patiently. It's in your precious holy name we pray. Amen. Come on, love God, love others. Have a great week, everyone. Amen. Oh, <laughs>